Hi there. Welcome to Between the Worlds. I'm Raven Dana, and this is February 27th, uh, 22722. So today um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, what it is, what happens when we meet the dead in our dreams. And um, a lot of people have had experiences after a loved one has passed of having them show up in the middle, even in the middle of a dream that has nothing to do with them and uh, reassure them, let them know they're fine, they're okay, that um, you know they've made a successful crossing. And you know, I've had so many people ask me, you know, is that real? Is that wishful thinking? Is that just me dreaming them up because I miss them? And it's not that we don't have dreams about people who have passed, we certainly do, but the dead do actually visit us in our dream time. It's a liminal space. It's a little bit easier. Um, I, I once had someone describe to me that when people are crossed over and they're trying to uh, reach us, for them, it's sometimes a similar experience to like being on, like holding your breath underwater. They can only make contact so long or hold the frequency so long, and then it's more difficult. So in the dream space, it's easier to make that contact and to be known and aware. Uh, so I'm going to share some information and some stories with you about that today, and also give you a few tips for how you can, if you want to, how you can invite that kind of experience into your life. Um, a little bit though first about uh, my family history again. My grandfather, uh, George, he, his name was actually Jeremiah, but he went by George, uh, was spoke about an experience that we now would call a near-death experience decades before people really talked about those experiences. Uh, he was very a very tough cookie. I mean, tough in the sense that he withstood a lot of trauma and managed to stay alive, right? He was, um, again, in World War I, he uh, was gassed, he was missing in action for a year and a half. He came back uh, after a year and a half of being in a military hospital. He came back um, addicted to morphine uh, for, the, for the pain. He had been uh, shot, his eye had come out, and he had literally said he so was looking down and he pushed it back in. Um, he came home from that experience and realized that he was not going to get help to get uh, to kick the morphine habit so he decided when um, the government the government was basically coming to supply him that he was just going to go cold turkey after a couple of years of being on morphine and he did and you know and he just did and I can remember his stories about you know how he would uh, you know be in convulsions and be sitting by the window at night you know asking for relief or death right so again I'm just giving you this because he's a a real um, strong, he, he was and is a very strong individual and kind, so kind. He, um, my childhood memories are filled with his kindness and generosity. Um, but this experience, when he was, uh, when he was older, he developed throat cancer, which was very sad, not just because he had throat cancer, but because he had this beautiful whistling voice, uh, he could whistle like a symphony. And so we missed Grandpa's voice and we missed his whistling. Uh, and at one point he was having surgery. He had insisted that um, the surgery would go. They, were, they didn't want to do it. They said, you probably won't heal. Um, in any event, he went and he had this surgery. Uh, on his throat, and uh, when he came out, when he, when it, when he was just about finished with the surgery, he went into cardiac arrest, and he was gone for uh, a long time. He was gone for 20 minutes or 21 minutes, and um, this was his experience, which he told to everyone. By that time in my childhood, my mom had already passed a couple of years before. She died the week after I turned 14, which is a story for a different day. But um, my grandfather's experience was this. He lifted out of his body. He saw himself being worked on below on the table. He rose up and he went through the roof. 
He went all the way into the sky where he saw something. He didn't know what it was. He described it as the closest thing he could call it was a winged horse. He didn't know what it was. But he got on it and it took off. And eventually he saw what he described uh, as an island. He saw an island. And as he approached the island, he saw my mother on the shore who was waving her hands in front of him and said, George, go back, go back. It's not your time. And when she said that, the whatever he was on threw him off and he fell down through the sky, down through the roof of the hospital, and he landed in his body on, on in the bed, hearing his... Um, heart monitor kick on and somebody saying he's back he's back we've got him back so very very interesting experience and again like I said near-death experience decades before people talked about such things but I'm sharing this with you because I think that you know we often will have experiences where, where we're interacting with the dead and we don't remember, or we brush it off as a dream, or you know, or some other thing. And um, I just want you to have the opportunity, if you want to take it, to invite those who have passed to talk with you, to meet with you, to check in with you, if you'd like to see them in your dream time. Um, I have had, uh, you know, like my grandmother has used to have prophetic dreams. I have had dreams for many, many years of going to a place which I call the Transition Hotel. Clearly it's, you know, some kind of way station where the dead and the living come together. That's, you know, I don't know what it is really, but it shows up for me like a hotel, uh, complete with a, a lobby and a person behind the desk. And um, it's a very convenient, um, however it makes itself known to me, because I can navigate the space pretty easily. And, and I've had experiences there uh, that have been absolutely extraordinary, um, and I'm just going to tell you one of them. So we've had a long, we had a long-time family friend that we hadn't talked to in a couple of years, and uh, we were, my daughter and I were wondering what became of him, what, you know, where he was, why he wasn't in contact. And I had a dream that I saw his name, he saw, I saw him registered at the hotel. And, and I was very concerned and I said, we need to find him, we need to see what's going on because there's something happening here. Well, we discovered that he actually was very, very ill, he had liver cancer. And he didn't want anybody to know. And so that's why he hadn't reached out to anybody. And um, uh, even the circumstances under which we found out were kind of uh, extraordinary. And a few days after that, a few days after we found out that he was home and he had liver cancer, we didn't know how bad it was. We didn't know what stage it was. We didn't know, we didn't know anything except that he was home, not doing well. And I had the, this dream, this experience, where I was in a car and I was driving down a street that was reasonably empty. And there was a, a stoplight and at the corner, I saw him, I saw our friend. And he was confused and he was looking around and he said, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to get where I'm going. And I said, get in, get in the car. And he got in the car and um, he was wearing a, a gi, um, you know, a martial arts uniform. And I knew in that moment I needed to take him to drive him to the hotel, and I did. So in the dream, I took him there, I drove him to the hotel, I got him checked in, I told him everything was gonna be okay, that, some, that people would come and take care of him and he would have an orientation and things would be fine. Um, well, two days later, we found out that he passed. So again, dreams sometimes are much more than dreams. And um, I was grateful for the opportunity to welcome him into the, into the space, into the between. And I've had many dreams in that location with people who have passed, but also um, there, are, there are things in that between space where we can 
as the living. Go and learn things about the dead. Learn things about what it's like in the between. Go and discover things about ourselves that we have long forgotten. Things that are our connections with the earth and the energies and the spirits of the earth. So I encourage you um, to, to allow yourself to have some permission to explore the deep dream space. And if you have a loved one who has passed and you would like to visit with them uh, in a dream, rather than have them show up in your living room and m maybe you would be really frightened. Uh, so sometimes, you know, it's not that they don't visit us, we don't always know that they are visiting, okay? So I would suggest that perhaps before you go to bed, you think about that person and you actually invite them and say, I would like to see you, to meet with you, to see how you're doing. I would like to check in with you and see what happens. And I, I promise you that you'll know the difference between a dream that's a dream and a dream that opens into this experience of a visit with the dead. They're, they're quite different experiences. Um, uh, in, any, in any event, I have lots of stories of people who, after a loved one passed, they would have, uh, I have one for you, where her mom passed a couple of years before, and there was something that they were looking for, that the family had been looking for, that they couldn't find a, a piece of jewelry of the mom's. And she was very frustrated and very sad because uh, all the sisters loved this piece of jewelry and they wanted to wear it and pass it around among them to, to honor her. And um, she then asked her mother like to tell her where, like, I, I know that you must know where it is. And so she had a dream. And in the, in the context of her dream, she was doing, she was at a party, she was doing something that had nothing to do with her mother. And her mother... Um, Came to, the, came to the party, knocked on the door. And when she opened the door, the party disappeared. And it was just her and her mom. <clears throat> and her mother said to her, it's in the book. And she said, what are you talking about? What's in the book? And her mother took her by the hand, took her to the bookshelf, and pointed to a book that was a hollow book that she had kept things in that nobody knew was there. And... Um, then she woke up suddenly and thought, that can't be real. I've never even seen that book. So she got dressed. She went to her mom's house um, that her sister was now living in. And they had kept, you know, a lot of her belongings, her books, of course. Um, and she said, I had, you know, mom told me it was in a book. And they go to the bookshelf. They're looking for a book. They're looking for this book that had this blue, blue and white cover. Well, of course, she finds the book and opens it, and it is indeed a hollow book, and it has not only that piece of jewelry in it, but a couple of old love letters between her and uh, their dad. So it was um, it was a remarkable experience for her, and she really came to a sense of ease and peace, knowing that her mother, you know, is alive and well, even though she's on the other side and quite capable of communicating. And she was so grateful um, that she was able to visit with her mother. So um, again, uh, the dream time, the dream space is not just for dreaming. It's, that's one thing we do there, but it's also a portal, a gateway, an access point to other realities where we get to travel we get to pass through the dreaming or use it as a, um, you know, a train ride to use, to use the dreaming as a way to get to other dimensions, other places in time. And you might notice that you have recurring dreams. If you don't remember your dreams, I would encourage you to write them down. Even if you have a snippet, if you wake up and you don't really have a memory of a dream, but you have a feeling or you have an image, write it down. That is you communicating with that deep part of yourself. Look, our consciousness is enormous. And we're, we only have access to a very small part of reality when we're awake, at least direct access. We do have access, but we narrow our focus so we can navigate in three dimensions, right? It makes sense. So it's something that we can do uh, in order to get around, in order to survive in this kind of experience that we're having. 
but that doesn't mean that our consciousness doesn't reach out through all the other places. So think about it this way. You know, that, that photograph that you've seen, I'm sure, of uh, an iceberg with the very tip out of the water, and then the photograph of all the rest of the iceberg below the surface. That is exactly what our consciousness is like. We have our daytime awaking, waking awareness, which is that little tip of consciousness that sticks out of the water. And then we have the rest of our awareness, which is broad and deep and reaches down into the recesses of reality that is connected to every person, to every time and place. And it's an important concept, I think, to grasp. When we talk later about fascinating things like um, remote viewing, this is how remote viewing works. It is a skill that allows us access to the deeper part of our consciousness that we normally keep dialed down so we, can't, we don't really pay attention to it. We don't really hear it. But we can get and we do get information and intuitions that rise from those deep places. So if we listen, if we pay attention, we can get clues about things that show up in our daily lives because they're rising from our deep awareness relevant to our lives to get our attention. So again, I encourage you that if you want to travel in your dreams, if you want to meet with your deceased loved ones and friends in your dreams, that one of the practices is to allow yourself to slow down your mind a bit to listen to those messages, those memos, those intuitions, and to follow them, to go with them. If you're driving down a street and something tells you to take a different direction, take it. What difference does it make? If you're, go, if you're going to the store and something tells you to go down aisle three, and then you meet a friend that you haven't seen for three months, great. There's, you know, there was a memo there for you. You unconsciously had a clue that that person was over there in aisle three. So there are things like that that happen to us all the time. And to, to give them some credit, to lean into that part of your awareness is one way to help you open up the communication between the deeper sleep dream time space and your ordinary waking consciousness. So um, again, uh, I, I hope that you've taken something from what I've said today and um, can have an experience if that's what you want, or if you've had an experience, it might explain something to you. So have a great afternoon and thank you for tuning in. Again, if you have subscribed, thanks for that. And if not, and you'd like to hear more of these stories, please do. If you would like to ask me a question or if you want to suggest a topic, please feel free to email me, uh, ravendana55 at gmail.com. That's my name, ravendana, the number 55, at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you, and I would love to uh, know more about your own stories and your own experiences. So have a great day, and I'll see you next time.